everybody. We're going to call our community forum to order at 618 already. It's so nice to see so many people all the way in Foggy Palace. It was quite the drive for some. But we're excited to be here and thank you for you know having this so beautifully like, you know, Christmas but festive. And, yeah, we, we feel really welcome. I think I speak for everybody that Are up, you won't be able to see the people. That's a sad story. Well, while the slides are coming up, I just want to say I'm very glad to be here. And I've met some of you, but probably mostly on Zoom. Um, some of you I've met in person. And uh, before I start, I just want to call out Stephen Dellinger Pate because three and a half years ago, we had an idea, just an idea. The ILI thought, we were thinking, mm, the DEI stuff is not moving the needle enough for kids. And that mattered a lot to us, in part, because our kids were kids of color in this district, and we personally felt some of the hurt. And, and then as, as scholars and as activists, we were, what, it's gotta be so I did some research. Shelley, who's the equity scholar, was doing some practice. We went to Jody and Stephen and said, we wanna try some. Can we please make a duty too? And Stephen said yes. And if Stephen had said yes, we wouldn't be sitting here, and the impact that has been felt in the district since wouldn't have been felt. So I just want to thank Stephen for saying yes. I appreciate that very much. It's, uh, I was saying to him earlier, it's a hallmark of, in my book, it's a hallmark of good leadership to take a, a, a thoughtful risk, and he did. So I, I appreciate that a lot. Oh, now, let me go back. Okay, so I'm, I have like a 10 slides, maybe. I'm not gonna talk long. What I, what I do wanna do is explain who we are, what this partnership is about, because it's a critical partnership for us, what the ILI's approach to equity is, um, and sort of where we're going with that, and then open it up to your questions. Shelley Vermilia, who is the Equity Scholar in Residence in the district, is here to answer any questions about sort of the day-to-day, -day, what this looks like day-to-day. -day. There are also plenty of principals, educators in the room who can talk to you about it as well because they experience it. For now, though, again, I'm Lucinda Garthwaite. I'm the founder and director of the Institute for Liberatory Innovation. Um, I'll go a little further. We're a Vermont-based nonprofit. We actually operate out of a, an office in the barn in Plainfield. Um, and we, are, we call ourselves a social change generator. And what that means is that we, do, we, have, a, we have a mission to generate and implement innovative strategies so that more people thrive in ever more peace. And that's important because that is directly related to what we think about when we think about equity. Um, our core work, the behind the scenes work, is research and experimentation. That leads to new ways of addressing urgent social issues. Um, and then we, if we continually evaluate and learn. All of that's important because you, are our most important partner at this point in this work. Um, we, that all turns into publications, programs, and services. We're pretty new. Um, this is our most longstanding and robust program. We have others in the works, 
and others that are beginning to get off the ground. The, the work with the district is our most profound work at this point and has helped us to learn a tremendous amount. So the foundations, oh, whoops, there's some stuff, some stuff happened, it fell off the slide, it's okay. Unless it comes up, no. Um, there, was, there were columns that got lost in the, in the um, sending the email. Our foundations are liberatory practice, and I'll just take a minute to say what we mean by that is liberation can be singular, somebody gets out of jail, a people are freed, uh, a, a racist institution stops being racist, oh, oh, that's a hard thing to come up with. Um, and we believe liberatory, liberation is change. It doesn't, we're never gonna be done. It's, we're always gonna be working on it. That's why the word liberatory, it makes people go, what? <laughs> um, we work with compassion, we work with, all, in all of our programs, we, we lead with compassion, which simply means not wanting other people to suffer and acting on that. Um, we lead with accountability, not punishment. Um, we lead with a restorative process, as I said, not a punitive process. We believe in nonviolence. I can't remember the rest of the stuff that's on the slide, but certainly collaboration is a huge piece of our work. <coughs> it's not moving. Oh, there it is. Okay. We have a relationship with you. This is three slides work because I work because I think this is this is important for the board. Um, first of all, we have a learning partnership. For two years, from 2019 to 2021, after Stephen said yes, we did a pilot project at U32. That cost the district nothing. We did all of that work. Well, we paid for all of it. However, educators in the district did a ton of the work with us. It was very much collaborative action learning. Um, we went in with a theory and a model, the, a theory of change based on stuff we'd understood before and things we wanted to try. I can tell you more about that in a minute. Um, we hired an outside evaluator who was so taken by the, <laughs> taken by the model that she ended up coming to work with us later. Um, but, and we, and, and we continued, we, and I'll tell you more about that evaluation in a minute. Um, we continued to do evaluation and research in the district, never without the district permission. In fact, our work with the district is governed by an MOU that is completely in your favor. Megan could pull the plug tomorrow with no reason and we, we could be gone. We are required, I don't think she's going to, but she has, but it's important, it's important to you to, I think if I were on a school board, I'd want to know that you have that. It's in your favor, um, by design. Um, we, we are required to follow all of the policies and the MOU is pretty thorough in that regard. Um, we, anything we publish about the ESR, we acknowledge a district for its, your collaboration in developing the Equity Scholar Residence Model, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, and the ILI provides and supports all evaluation and research activity that never costs the district a penny, nor will it ever. So that's an important part of our relationship. The other thing that we do, that's the learning partnership. We also provide a resource, a paid resource to all, to the district which you all have approved in your budgets. Um, the ILI employs an equity scholar in residence, that's Dr. Shelley Vermilia who's sitting back there. Um, we provide services to the district and that's governed by an MOU. I consult with district leaders and you if you would like me to. None of that will ever cost you anything. Again, all because we couldn't do this if it weren't for the district. Um, we only charge, the, the, the cost of the district of the Equity Scholar of Residence is 70% of the actual cost of the program because we only charge a dollar comes from the district, it goes directly to compensation. Not, none of that comes off the top and goes to the ILI. We do everything else. So that's, that's an important piece. Um, so we have two, there are two parts of our relationship. One is a learning partnership, one is that we provide a service and they certainly overlap. The service we provide is the Equity Scholar in Residence model, which you, your educators helped us to develop. Um, the Equity Scholar in Residence model has four pillars. I almost went like this, three pillars. <laughs> <laughs> has, I have my doctorate. It has two pillars. <laughs> um, so the first three are quite well documented in prior research. We, we kind of knew those were gonna work going in, but we, we, um, 
with the help of educators in the district, we tweaked them. One is embedded genuine relationship. There's an independent contractor in the schools. We used to think that we needed to have a contractor in every school. It's beginning to feel like we could actually, we can succeed with a contractor embedded in the district so that they don't have to be in the school every day, they have to be in schools every day. So this is a full-time contractor. This is, this is Shelly's full-time job. And she's in some school or in the district office or in her own office doing responsive scholarship. We'll get back to that in a minute. Um, full-time. Um, their job is to, their primary job is to intentionally develop genuine relationships. The next thing they do is learner-centered education, specifically responding to context-based questions and challenges identified by educators and community members. So you're going to start to see a theme here. Our theory of change is that if we can get, edu get more and more educators to be more and more willing and confident to really engage issues of equity, that that will change the experience for young people and for other educators in the system. Um, that's getting tweaked a little bit as we go, but that was our theory of change to begin with. So they're learner-centered. This is critical. You'll see in a minute when I show you the different slides what that means. We're always meeting people with compassion and a restorative approach. So it's our response to talent with kindness and without prejudgment. This has been really important. Um, there are stories I can tell you, but I, and I do tell them in other situations, but I'm not gonna tell them here because you all know the people too well, and even if I disguise them, I'll, I'll blow their cover. Um, but there are certainly quite a few stories of people coming into the ESR's office, shutting the door and saying, I am so tired of being called, I'm looking at Kari, because I know Kari, so I'm gonna use you for a second, okay? So Kari could walk into the ESR's office and shut the door and sit down and say, I'm really good man and I'm tired of being called a white racist. Mm -hmm. Now, it would be hard for me to go, you know what, Kari, you got some stuff to work on. That's not, that's not where we start. We start with, we start with, oof, tell me more. I, I need to understand this. And then we move from there. Um, and that has worked every time w with great effect. I had a state level educational leader in tears with me on Zoom when he realized that a change he had seen happen came from an interaction with Shelley. He said to me, I've been working with this person for four years. I could not get him to move. What did she do? So I went back and said, Shelley, what did you do? <laughs> he came into my office, he was really pissed off. I said, how can I help? And two half-hour sessions later, that guy was in Mike's office going, we got to do something about diversity. <laughs> Where did this come from? Um, all right. So they also strengthen those relationships through respect and mutual accountability. And finally, those, all three of those things are well-researched, are already well-researched. There's plenty of literature that says that moves the needle for educators. That gets educators to do better by young people. The last thing we made up, which is responsive scholarship. Responsive scholarship is pretty simple. It means that we have a scholar who, by definition, know, needs to know how to find information and put it to use. That's what a scholar is, really. Um, and we have a scholar who is well-versed in issues of equity and identity and education, and they know how to find information, and they don't come into the district and say, this is what you need to learn. They come into the district and listen. And then when, Chris says, I don't know, okay, this is a story I can't tell. When an elementary school teacher comes up to Shelley and says, oh my God, I just got a call from some parents. I have a trans kid in my first grade class. What is trans? Mm -hmm. I really don't know. And what do I do with a seven-year-old? I, I don't know. Shelley goes back. She goes into the literature, she finds out developmentally what's going on, she finds out what the schools are doing, she finds out what the politics are, she goes, she goes back, she brings that information to the teacher, the two of them put their heads together and serve that student. That's a real story that happened in your district. And it happens over and over and over again. That's responsive scholarship. So Shelley doesn't come in and do a training just from her own head. She responds. 
So those are the four models of the equity scholar residence model. Um, in action, it's a full-time contractor embedded in the district. Uh, Shelley provides regular and on-call consultation with all kinds of people in the district. I just listed a few. Um, she provides on-call support, and this is important. Shelley doesn't work with students unless an educator asks her. So Shelley doesn't, if a student who Shelley already knows comes into her office, she'll meet, she'll, she won't turn them away. But she doesn't show up in a classroom or create a club or it's always at the behest of and in collaboration with employees, educators. Um, and then she will consult with leader. This has been really important in our evaluation. Administrators said this was one of the most important things. When there's an urgent challenge, Shelley can come in and help figure that out based on the emerging literature. What's best practice yesterday? Because this stuff changes every single day. <coughs> um, there is professional development. The ESR will work with school PD committees and create trainings and, and offer trainings, but only in collaboration with the educators. Um, do it district-wide. And one of the things that happened, because Jen, I think, suggested it, um, is that now we have a regular credit-bearing course, which, which teachers can take at no additional cost to the district. That's part of the program. Um, and that's been really popular and pretty profound. That's where the Humanity and Justice Coalition came from, because at the end of every one of those courses, there's a project. And Shelley teaches that course. Um, Jen makes sure it gets credit. Shelley has the doctorate and the credentials to do it. She's to college, so that's all good. Ongoing, the ESR encourages conversation, offers observations, and initiates <coughs> and tends relationship all the time. Um, this is a pretty important slide. So I'm going to take my time. There are other <coughs> professional resources to deal with educational equity. And they're fine. And they have had some unintended consequences, given more, more and more research and experience. Um, the Equity Scholar in Residence is employed by the ILI and contracted to serve as an embedded colleague. We didn't know that was important. When we started, we thought this was going to be a school employee. The principal said to us, we need somebody who can speak truth to power, please. So that changed us. That, we went in, the ILI went in thinking we were creating a position that schools could hire. We would just give them the model. We'd sell them the model, and they could hire the person. We could train them. The principal said, no, 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 no. Well, Shelly's the only one that would come in my office and close the door and go, what are you doing? And, and that happens regularly. Um, remember, respectfully and compassionately and caringly, not, in, not with a chip on their shoulder. Um, the other resource is a school staff member with associated, and I'm just going to go down the left hand side. The Equity Scholar in Residence is a scholar who knows how to find resources to address emerging and urgent needs. They're a learner set and educator. They respond to the needs of the school, specific school, and this is important for tonight, to the community. What's happening right now, right this minute, is that up until this moment, the Equity Scholar of Residence has served schools one at a time. The ILI is now making me available to work with the district if you think I can be helpful. Not as a scholar, as a different kind of thing, which we'll figure out after I'm done talking together, because we're learning. Um, it's the ESR is a collaborative colleague offering insights, asking questions, thinking with providing resources. The other kinds of resources. I'm getting out of the way so you all can see it. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could hire a school staff member with associated employment requirements. So we can go, okay, teacher, we're going to give you a couple courses off. You take care of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You bring in a drop-in expert in social and educational equity with a particular perspective, a particular ideological perspective, a particular take on what's the right way to go. Um, you bring in a drop-in trainer. Or you put a DEI coordinator director in place, and they're tasked with organizing and leading social equity. The problems with that, even according to the Harvard Business Review, is that training, drop-in training, has not moved the needle. We can train till the cows come home. I can tell, I'm sorry, Carrie, you're the only one I know, so I'm going to pick on you. Um, you're the only one I know well enough to pick on. Oh, I can pick on Floor. But, I, you know, I, I'll pick on Floor. I could tell Floor stuff that I believe about race, class, gender, about equity, about, about economic um, insecurity, about religion. I could tell her stuff 
I could try to get her more culturally competent. There are two problems with that. One is that there's plenty of research that says telling people stuff doesn't necessarily get them to change. And the second thing is that that will change tomorrow. Tomorrow, some child will show up in your district that has a whole new way of being and learning, and the teachers are going to go to the principal and go, what do I do with that? And we won't have known we should have trained for that. And the teacher will probably make a mistake, and the child's educational opportunities will be limited. Not because anybody did anything wrong. If we have an equity scholar in residence in place, the principal calls Shelley. Shelley comes right over. I mean, right over, because remember, they're embedded full time in the district, and says, "We got what? Do, what do you know about this kind of presentation of being human?" And Shelley goes and finds out, brings it back to Cat. The two of them work with the teacher, and they figure out what to do. So it's different. Um, so that's the problem with training. The problem that's happened. Oh man, the research on this is so sad. When we put DEI coordinators in place, who are most often people who are already marginalized in the system, they get hurt. It's, it's, I'm going to say, this is my opinion, well intended, and they get hurt. I have plenty of colleagues who've been badly hurt by be, being put in that position. Let me give you a raise and then tell us what to do, a person with a disability about all equity, please. It, that has, the research is more and more and more telling us that that's not, a, that model is hard on those people. An equity scholar of residence is not a leader. They are not a coordinator. They are an equity scholar in residence. You have leaders, you have coordinators, you've got educators. They just need support. So that's the difference in the model. Um, our, our research evaluation in 2021, which we didn't continue during the really sort of, uh, I'm sorry, 20, yeah, in 2021, which we didn't continue last year because it was such a chaotic year. We didn't, we didn't do anything. Shelley was just in the district. The ILI itself did nothing. We left Jen and her staff alone. Um, I mean, Shelley was there to support them, but I left everybody. I was quiet. So what we have right now is that all respondents indicated, all of them, we talked to teachers and coaches and counselors and all different kinds of people. We interviewed people. Um, they all said they had increased confidence and willingness to engage in conversations. They all reported, and we didn't expect this, increased frequency and depth of reflection on issues of social equity. That was new. We didn't know that was coming. The evaluator found that as a surprise. Administrators, also by surprise, as I said earlier, strongly affirmed the embedded independent contractor and, and said to us, we're able to do our jobs only because this person is here. There are expectations of us that we didn't know how to fulfill before, and now we do. Um, I'm not going to bother you with all the quotes, um, but I like them. I mean, you can see them while I talk. And then um, this is just a little bit of an example of what some teachers and coaches and counselors said. I'll be quiet for a minute. If you can read it, you can look at it. What we need to do now is do some quantitative research, and we're and we are working. We are starting that process now. Jen and Megan have been amazing colleagues to me in figuring out how to approach that. Um, that'll happen in the spring. The ILI is doing some research now to figure out what best practices are, and then we're going to take those best those behavior. We're going to look at behaviors that have engendered that have made it possible. I'm going too fast, and I'm on the slide for this. We're going to do some preliminary research, and then we're going to use that research to do some evaluation, quantitative evaluation. When the ILI talks about equity, remember, our mission is to innovate so that more people thrive and never more peace. We do that in schools, communities, and organizations. We're not trying to change the world. We're trying to help schools, communities, and organizations change. Any of you who know systems work know they're pretty big leverage points for change. If you can get those things to change, things start to change. Our definition of equity is that all children are thriving and learning as who they understand themselves to be and are becoming, and that their behavior is allowing other children to thrive and learn in the same way. We also 
know that that means adults in the schools need to thrive as who they are and are becoming. And their behavior, the best they can, needs to ensure that students thrive and learn. That's how we understand equity. Because people are constantly expressing their humanity in new ways, because, as I said earlier, children arrive in schools every year, every day, with new and different ways of presenting them being human, um, and because new insights are emerging all the time about how to use equity. Equity is a process, not a finish line. It's never going to be done. Um, that's the ILI's perspective. It doesn't mean we can't solve specific problems. It doesn't mean we can't make specific things go away, singular inequities. It means equity, ensuring that all students thrive as who they are and are becoming, is, is, a, light, is a forever project. And this is really important. It is really possible and it is essential to stop singular limitations and threats to equality. Shelley, can I tell the story from this afternoon that you told me? <clears throat> so this afternoon, Shelley went into a bathroom at high school and happened to see a racist term on the wall. And she let somebody know, and within five minutes, all five maintenance staff people were in there, and it was gone, five minutes later. We need to respond that quickly to singular limitations on students. We need to respond as quickly as we can to singular limitations. And by that, I mean um, we cannot tolerate and we must respond quickly to bigoted behavior and violence, behavior and violence that is driven by beliefs in that other people should not be able to express themselves as who they are and are becoming. And we need to shift behavior quickly that emerges from honest ignorance. I don't probably need to explain to you what honest ignorance is because my guess is that every single one of you has experienced it. I didn't know that. I'm so sorry I hurt you. I will do everything I can not to do it again. And I will come back to you and check in about that. That's honest ignorance and accountability. So we also need to identify and change systemic artifacts. And an artifact in a system is what it sounds like. It's anything we make. It's processes and policies and documents and traditions. And we need to identify the ones that limit people's ability to thrive and learn as who they are and are becoming. Um, and we also, it's also possible, this is the ILI's belief, to make peace even where there is disagreement about what it means to behave in ways to allow all children to thrive and learn. Now I'll say to you right now, because I'm learning with you as I talk, because that's what we do. But I am beginning to wonder if we can say in a school system, you go ahead, Lindy, believe what you want. If you're working here, you need to behave in this way. You go ahead, student, if you come from a family that believes nobody should be gay, you can believe that. You still have to behave in a way that gay students can thrive and learn in this school. I'm just beginning to play with that. I'm not saying something, this is not something the district has adopted. This isn't a big policy statement. I'm talking to board and principals and maybe a couple of community members and I'm saying, I'm thinking about this. Think with me. Is, this, is that something we should be thinking about? That's how the ILI operates and that's the nature of our learning part. <clears throat> so that's, that's the ILI, that's the ESR. What I hope will happen tonight and ongoing is that you all will challenge me, will ask questions. I will only learn from that. Um, I am so, and I just want to say to the board in particular, I don't think I've ever had such amazing learning colleagues as Megan and Jen. I mean, it, it's, we get moved to tears when we sit in their offices and think about these things together. So I just want to say as a community member, nice job, <laughs> thank you. Um, and I just want to express my gratitude to them, per personally and professionally. But um, it, it's not just intellectual, it's moving. And all three of us, when we're sitting in that room, anybody that watched would know the bottom line is we just want all children to learn and thrive. All of them. So, I'm going to stop talking.
and uh, I think I went over 10 minutes, I'm sorry. Um, but I did went way over 10 minutes. Shoot! At least I didn't sing, huh, Shelley? Okay. Because, you know, when I get a microphone, I'm really, really having a hard time right now. Like the songs, like 70s pop tunes, are just coming through my brain, but I won't do it. What would you <laughs> later, Kat? Don't even if anybody like starts a bar in the yellow. If anybody sings the bar at seventies pop, okay. What what do you think? <clears throat> the first question is, what do you think? What are your what are your what sounds good? What sounds questionable? What to, what what? I loved your example you used with me. That I can believe what I believe, but I have to behave in a way that everyone can thrive and learn in the school. And you know, Lydia, that thank you. That's I'm not absolutely sure that I believe that yet. I'm trying that on, yeah. but I'm grateful for the feedback. I like feedback. even bringing it out, I guess, Great. and talking about it. Okay. Because I do it with children. Okay. Okay. I'm there a teacher. Go. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can think that. You can Bless talk about your that. Heart. But right here. We have other people who that might hurt their feelings. Right. Okay, thank you. Curry. I wasn't gonna talk about this, but I, I completely agree with this too, because it, um, well, it's all, it's the only thing that works. You can't change beliefs easily anyway. And you, 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 can, you can actually get change in this because, you might be able to get change because you're not judging the person in their identity. They don't feel threatened necessarily. If they just know that it's their behavior, it's not their beliefs they're trying to. But what I wanted to say was, I think it's wonderful. I, th I think this is really inspiring. I'm very appreciative of everything that you're doing. I hope it's sustainable for you. And um, it makes me want to like fast forward 20 years and see where we've gotten mm -hmm. with this exciting new model. But your point about this being a process makes me think it's exciting to be here now. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And a question I wanted to ask, if I could, is what um, what do you see as the key limiting factors to having impact? And I guess the, the flip side of that would be if you could change one or two things, what would like, really move this forward? Do you think? I don't, you know, I know it's really big. Why that is, a, it's such a hard question I don't know how to answer. And I'm looking at Shelly. Honestly, I don't, I'd have to think about it really hard and I'm not sure I would answer because it's complex. Because, um, I don't know, Shelley, do you have a different answer than that one? I, I, I don't know, I mean, you know what? Really? A $300,000 grant, $300, grant from the Bar Foundation would help. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, I, I, I think that, okay, well, the only way I can answer that is this. For me, personally, speaking for me, Inequity in schools is terribly urgent. Speaking for me, um, the existence of racist behavior, genderphobic behavior, um, homophobic behavior, go right down the line, is, it is, and I want it to be done yesterday. I want it to be over. I want no more harm. And that's what drives me in the work. I'm done. I mean, I have, very, I have very little patience for it anymore. In my private life, I'm known to go swear a lot. It hasn't worked. It didn't work. I have a very long history of activism in education, and, and I have done all that stuff. I have called people out. I have beat people over the head. I have, I have trained. I have, and it hasn't changed anything. So that's why I'm suggesting this other things. I know I'm not really answering your question, but it's the best I can do. Sorry, but I'll think about it. Chris. So how do you know when the needle has moved? Say that how again? How do you know when the needle has moved? That's a really good question, and that's why we're doing the next set of research. Um, so what we're going to do next is the ILI is going to do some research, and in, we're going to interview uh, students who have experienced inequity based on their own social identity or social identity entities that people put on them that they didn't want, and their parents. The ILI is doing this. The, the school, the district has, has given us permission to reach out to find participants. This is our work. And once we, and we're gonna hopefully identify some common practices 
that have moved the needle for individual students, right, in that way. And then what we're going to do is we're going to switch to a quantitative piece where we're going to start counting the number of times that happens. We're going to start counting how many times teachers do that, right? So that we'll be able to start to see if the needle's moving on teacher behavior. Then, Megan is going to work with, with understanding, beginning to measure the, the culture of the school and beginning to see if that needle changes, right? The equity culture. That's, so we're, we'll collaborate with Megan on that, but that's Megan's going to take that on. So first, we're going we're to find out what the behaviors are that have moved the needle for individuals, educator behaviors, right? So when, let me get really specific, when a student has experienced inequity based on their self-identified, for example, race, we're going to ask that student, when did it get better? What did teachers do to make it better, even, either in a moment or long term? We're asked the parents too, right? Then we're going to, we're going to find behaviors and then we're going to count them. So what we hope to do over the next couple of years, right, couple, three years, is begin to see coincident, we won't be able to tie them together, together causally. I know I'm talking like researching terms now, but we'll be able to see coincident changes. We have counted that we can say quantitatively that the, first of all these behaviors work and we're seeing more of them. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the, uh, the culture of equity is changing in the schools. We're, we're having fewer reports of what I call singular limitations and, and systemic artifacts that are creating a problem. Does that answer the question? It does. So would you also reach out to the um, student who did the offending behavior and find out if their behavior moved in, no. what was it that, that, it, that has to be, I think, part of the... Point. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that is a, um, that's another kind of question and it's a little bit more challenging to find participants. Yeah. So given our resource limitations, we're not going to do that now, but I would love to do it down the road. Right now, we're going to speak to 18 and over, 18 year old and over students older students and recent graduates and their parents and parents of any age do. And we're just focused on what's happened to make it better for them for now. Okay. Um, I love that question and I'd love to be able to get to it. But we have more resources we will. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. So in just reflecting on, on that, first off, you're, what you're working on in terms of saying, you know, you can you can have that belief, but here we do this. It, I guess the thing that sticks to me, and I just wanted to reflect it back, is I, it's, I worry about validating in any way. I do too. And That's so why it, yeah. it's almost like, uh, how do we help them compartmentalize without validating? Um, and so that that's the only thing that that's really helpful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. I mean, this is I, I can't I can't say sincerely enough. I really am not sure about what I said. <laughs> and so this all of this back and forth really helps me to think. Yeah. So thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. And then a question is: Is Washington Central yep. the only school system that you're currently working with, or no, are there? Yes, that is. We are the only school system we're currently working with. There are other schools that want us. The ILI doesn't have the capacity to scale yet. Mm. That there comes the three hundred thousand dollars. Well, we need we need a staff a dedicated staff mm -hmm. person who can scale. We have another school that wants an equity scholar. We don't have the capacity to find them one. Mm -hmm. They have the budget. They have the board has approved it. They have the money to pay for it, but we haven't been able to find them a scholar. Mm -hmm. And we can't clone show. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's the school. Okay. Yeah, but we haven't been able to find a scholar. That's right. Right. That's right. Yeah. And there are other schools. That, you know, Mike, the Vermont Principal Association, knows where other schools would like to have this, but we're not going after them because we don't have the capacity to fill the positions and, and manage the program yet. We will. That's the plan. Anybody else? Yes. You, you mentioned about community members having access to the equity style and residence. Yep. How does that come about? You know what? We, ha we haven't done it yet, but it is part of the... I'm going to say, Shelley, if a community member needed to talk with you, had a question, how would they reach you? I have an email. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think that... Um, I think we... If we're going to start making Shelley more available to community members, it probably needs to go out in a newsletter from Megan, and we ought to talk about that with Shelley. Um, 
it's a workload issue if it gets too big. However, I, in terms of in terms of consulting, and I'm not an equity scholar. I'm not the person who's going to go find the information if that's not my skill. Give it out to me. But <laughs> if I need information, I can get it from Shelley. I'm just not going to go find it. If I need, if, if you and I are having a conversation on a consulting basis as a board member, and there's something I don't know, I have access to Shelley. Um, but we're, it's new to start thinking. That's exactly what tonight's about. It's new to start thinking. How do we bring this out in the community? How do we bring this approach to the community? Um, so, for starters, based on that question, I'm going to talk to Shelley and Megan, this is a commitment, to see about whether we can let the community know that Shelley is available to them as a scholar. I, it may make more sense in some ways for me to be available as a facilitator, but we'll, since you asked the question, we'll go with it. Okay, thank you. Flora, oh, sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Go ahead. Um, I'm curious, why are you only talking to students who are 18 or older performers? It's completely about consent and um, legal issues from a research perspective. We don't, I like not have the capacity to do the consent work to mm -hmm. work with younger students. No. It's the only reason. It's the only reason. It's no. just a financial so reason. You're going to be missing a whole lot of information. I know. A lot of students are that's why we're going, that's where we're going after parents. We're, we're looking. There's a lot of students who aren't talking to their parents. Okay. You know what? That's really good feedback. And uh, I haven't been able to figure out how to overcome that limitation, but it's a big limitation in the yeah. study. I, I'm with you. I know it is. We're going to try to get stuff for the parents. What I'd like to do is do this, this piece, mm -hmm. and based on the strength of that, get some grant money and do a more thorough. It's, it is a very limited study. I mean, if you wouldn't know anything about research, you know that. Um, it's on the face. It's limited. So thank you for that, because that's the nudge I needed to work on. Thank you. Floor. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more with the board and the community since it's being recorded about how we're working with the elementary schools too. Sometimes this work is perceived as just yes. in high school, and I think we could just integrate it a little bit. Well, sure. And I'll defer to Shelley. I'm going to try to reflect what the ESR does with the elementary schools. But Shelley has relationships with all the principals, many of whom are here. Um, Shelley's job is to really work to create those relationships. Um, and then, and often what she's doing is working with the professional development committees, am I right? I'm looking at the principals in those schools. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. So she's working with librarians, at, at, right? All across, from our parents to our classroom teachers. So for the last two years at EMES, we have what's called conversations with Shelly in the <laughs> library on Friday mornings. Um, and it's open to anyone and who would like to be there. Last week we had an, a new attendee um, from our ESP and really it's just kind of an open conversation. What's happening? What are you seeing? What, is, what are we talking about? Shelly asks great questions, she listens, and then also gives us resources like, oh, I know this is happening in this school or let me talk to you, the U32 students about this opportunity. Um, and acts a bit like a liaison, mm -hmm. and really just a sounding board and just a pretty informal conversations about like what are you hearing, what's going on, what what issues are you dealing with? What's the word of the week? <laughs> <laughs> and and also as a follow up to that, she'll go in and work with teachers in classrooms, like around different units or topics or conversations. Sometimes teachers might reach out to her and say, hey, I'm, I need to broach this subject, or this has come up a lot in the classroom. How can we handle this? And Shelly says, let me come in, and, and they work together through it. It's the best. <laughs> it, thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful. Kat, is it different for you? It is a little bit different. I got to know Shelly um, in the Wayback Machine. We did response, we started up a practice stream together. She's still fun to play with. Um, <laughs> And I took the class, was it last year or the year before? You were in the class as well. Um, and it just really opened up in my thinking. Um, and since then, I, it, we didn't formalize it until just recently. Um, but it has just been my way to have that close, girl, we gotta talk. Um, can, can you come in and I'm going to close my no, door? She'll text. And, she'll text. <laughs> <laughs> Call me right now. Um, and she lets me walk through 
um, hard things where I can sort of think imperfectly and talk out loud and try things out in a way that feels not safe because you want me to change my language to brave. Um, and to really think through uh, some of the challenges that happen with our littles. like. Uh, um, and we're a small school, a really homogenous small school. Uh, and uh, so a lot of class differences. And kids walking in um, with privilege and kids walking in with not. And they're all in the same classroom. And when that comes together in awkward or funky ways, we look for some grace. And I don't know how many times Shelly's been like, OK, I've got, I don't have an idea right now, but I'm going to do some research and I'm going to come back to you. Then I'll get an email with. Um, uh, some article I've got to read, or a YouTube video that I've got to watch, or a TED talk, and it's, it's just she's. It's the first time I was like, oh my goodness, that's what it means. That's what the scholar piece means. <laughs> um, it, it's a beautiful thing when it all comes together, and we've started just recently talking about how to make it more accessible to to more staff members because it's a vulnerable conversation to have for adults. Um, we just started our. Um, chats with Kat and Shelly, uh, uh, inviting people in. We're, we're hoping to get where Alicia's at, at East Montpelier. We're not there yet. That's, thank you, that's really helpful. And Lucinda, if yeah. I can add to, these are great examples of one of the things that I appreciate about this model, having, having experienced kind of the, um, the thou shalt have X, and this is how it should function, and this is how the work will happen, and not finding success this is a good example of the embedded nature, building relationships, and therefore helping people understand what, what you benefit from, and then letting individual systems pick the model that's going to work. And then what I'm most interested in as it moves forward is the balance between accountability and expecting that something is happening in every part of our system, and there is a non-negotiable component, and yet what that is is really driven by the needs of the system, the needs of the kids, the framework. So for me, it's a, it's a really, just that conversation is a good example of why this work is different in a good way and that it's not without a systemic and, and structured approach. And that's where we're headed. And that's exciting because that's how you, that's how you balance both. Uh, so I just wanted to add. One of the things Can I add to it that she also participates in new teacher um, training um, with teachers at all levels and makes herself available for in service um, regularly. So it's an ongoing conversation. I, I'm also aware that there, I mean, you text Shelly, Shelly gets a text from a, an elementary school principal who says, We got a crisis right now in a classroom, help. And because she's embedded, she's there. Um, so those things are happening. Did that answer your question about elementary school floor? Well, you know what? I realize that you know. Remember that slide that I was missing a column. The last word on that column. The last words were determined and persistent. Um, I, I, I can speak for myself, and I can speak for Shelley. Really, this, it's not negotiable for us. We have got to make things better for students in schools. I mean, we, and we can't. And if the old ways aren't working. Even if they're precious to me, I gotta let them go and do something different. So all of this seems to be having an effect. We'll be measuring it much more thoroughly going into the next few years. And again, you, your district is making that possible. I hope we together are gonna find that this really does move the needle for students and not incidentally, for teachers, for educators, for staff members in the systems who also experience inequity. So if we find that out, then this district will forever have been the district that helped us create a model that could really make a difference in the world. And honestly, thank you. Yes, Floor. So one of the things so that is sort of actionable for the board, I think as a board we've done a good job about a reaffirming the statement from the coalition. I think that's something that we should reconsider doing again until we have an equity policy. I think the other important thing is that as a board, we're responsible for setting the tone and being completely committed. So this is a lens that we're using to look at 
budget and plans that the administrators use to set those three priorities that we've been talking about. So hearing you speak tonight reaffirms that we're working towards, you know, we're working in the right direction of support, but there's still steps that we need to take to continue this journey together with, with you. And one of them to me is like, what do we have enough resources? And until you come back with this data, we don't know what we need. You know, I, I worry when you said that now Shelly's gonna be available to community too. I'm like, how many Shelly's can we have, right? Like if, you, if she's gonna be more available to other principals. So it would be interesting to know if we need more resources as a, as, as a board and also to commit ourselves to working in an equity policy, which I know that the policy committee is working on. But in the meantime, confirming the Justice Coalition statement would be a good step towards. Thank you, Flora. You'll notice I was non-committal about Shelley being available to the whole committee, because I have the same concern, which is why I said Shelley and I are now talking about it, and figure out what being available to the community means, because it's a big community. It's like five towns and a lot of people, and we can't do that. Um, but I do wonder, if, you know, it came up and now I think we're going on two years when the conversation around the Black Lives Matter flag, when the, re, the second year request, I believe, came in. And, and we as a board said that it was important for us to have a better understanding, but we still were placing it on our students to educate us, which isn't right. I, yes, and, I, and I think I can say unequivocally, Shelley, Stop me if you need to. Okay, then that Shelly is available to the board, and that's what I'm wanting. You know, to me that yeah. would be the we most are, helpful. We thing are. Too. I am in terms of facilitation, thinking about policy, that kind of thing. I can do that. I can say that to, for the, this community right here, if you have questions, Shelly can help answer them. That she's. Yeah. She can be the ESR for the whole, for the community. Yeah. Right, and I, I mean, I would also say too, I also have a monthly time with Shelly that I very much appreciate. And these are the types of things we talk through is, well, what would this look like? Or I'm thinking about this communication out to the community. Can, we, can you help me with that? This is a good conversation because it helps us now be able to say, what would it look like to be accessing the community? It doesn't necessarily mean everybody has Shelly's email address, although well, they could probably look it up. It might mean, do we post? Do 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 I? Do we post some questions out to our community? Do we use our communication structure to ask for input, and then the input might, you know, coalesce around some themes, and then we offer something. So there's different ways that I think we could bring it to the community. And again, what I appreciate about the structure is, I have great people to think this through, and this that's a big, lots of people. So and 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 Flora, we don't know. As I said earlier, we. We, the evaluator said, I think you need for every, I forget what she said, for every 700 students or three schools, you need an equity scholar. Well, we're not doing that. We have six schools and a lot more than 700 students. So we're finding, and that's purely financial, because, you know, we, um, but we're, we're trying it out and we're seeing if, if, if it's sustainable for Shelley. Um, it will be sustainable for us when we can scale, and that's an ILI problem, that's not the district's problem. You know, there's another word that I just want to throw out to you that's not on the list, which is relentless. Mm -hmm. There's a nonprofit in, in Chelsea, the Prince just visited actually, that I'm pretty closely affiliated with, it's called Roca. They have a 98% success rate keeping young, primarily kids of color, out of jail and in jobs. 98% is the best success rate anywhere in the country. And it's because they are relentless. They never stop. And that's what this is required. This is a, if I leave you with one thing tonight, it's never done. Working against inequity and for equity is forever. And it's got to be, and you got to be relentless about it. So that's a word that I don't, I want to leave in, in your heads. But somebody had a question. Did you have a question? Yeah. So when resources are being shared, with um, individual educators or principals, is that being added to some kind of compilation of resources under different topic areas that people can access? Because it seems like there could be a fair amount of redundancy and people could be accessing those things independently. 
um, in addition to potentially making those available to the community. Um, we have a great resource from the in-service days. Um, and I just want to add that we, the Humanity and Justice Coalition is open to community members. Mm -hmm. And we that is one entity that I hope will continue way beyond me. Uh, it'll grow and change and be really part of the, the community and the school uh, thinking about all these issues. And, and in addition to what Shelley just said, I'm going to say no, directly answering your question. That would be a huge undertaking, and I'll tell you why. Because Shelley's, you just heard Kat talk about it, or somebody talk about it. When Shelley finds a resource, it's for a specific challenge that a specific educator is having. And, it ha and it's an interaction, it's, a, it's an it, a relational, it's in the context of a relationship, right? So when it's a training, those resources, as Shelley just said, are, they are collected. Mm -hmm. When it's a specific one-on-one -on -one interaction, Diane, this teacher, says to Shelley, I don't know what to do about it. So if somebody was teaching Lord of the Flies one year and there was a situation in that classroom, I don't know what to do, and Shelley, in the context of that relationship, found some resources. I don't know how we could systematize collecting all of those. So I'm directly answering your questions. I haven't figured that out yet. It's a cool idea, but we haven't figured out how to do it. So just to be transparent about that. But the I, formal stuff is collected, and we have to stop. Oh, we do. Uh, one quick thing, though, Maggie, and we have only had this much of a conversation about it, but we have started talking, I'm pointing at Jen, around we really should have a section of our website dedicated to this work, mm -hmm. partially to tell the story about what it is and why and why it's designed this way. It could also become something that is a little bit more of a public-facing resource so that we could share resources. So again, we have not had very much of that conversation, but I think your question is, mm -hmm. is, is a good one and it's part, of, it's part right. of the conversation. It would be a cool iteration, so I appreciate you asking the question. It would be really amazing. One more note. Out of the first class came a project from one of the people in the class. Uh, it's called Celebrations. It's a magnificent website that's available to teachers and all of our staff here. Um, they created this, and they keep adding to this website about all kinds of resources, films, books. Um, it's available for everybody. So I'm going to stop because I promised 7.15. I actually promised a 10-minute PowerPoint, but I won't promise that again. <laughs> I'm sorry, Megan. And uh, thank you all so much for doing this work. It's hard to be on a school board. Um, and all of you for doing the work in the schools and for having us be, be part of your community. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. First, just thank you for having me. And thank you, Floor, for being on the Central Vermont Career Center School Board. And also want to let everyone know that Terry Steele is a representative from the Washington Central Unified Union School District. She was appointed as our member of our board this year. So 
two great representatives from your district. Um, one of the things that's really important for us to note and to get the word out about this year is that for all of the life of the Career Center, Barry City and Barry Town have been the only towns voting on our budget. And so now we have 16 new towns, your towns included in those, that are voting for our budget for the first time. They'll see it on a ballot. It'll be a separate ballot from yours and it will look like more money and it's not. It's already embedded in your budget, the tuition that you send to us. So we need to make sure that voters know, yes, we're voting for this additional 3.5 million that looks like extra, but it's embedded across all of the sending schools um, in their budget. So I'm hopeful that that message is what we get out and I am really sorry that I wasn't there tonight. <clears throat> I haven't made it to much this week, unfortunately. So I'm glad I can at least be here virtually. Also from the presentation that you might've had in your packet, the slideshow that I'm preparing to share has been updated and slide eight in particular was inaccurate. So I, I just wanna note that. So hopefully I'm presenting, but it's not big yet. Here we go. It's been a while since I used Zoom. <clears throat> so thank you. Um, one of the things that we noticed when putting this together uh, is that we don't actually have a mission statement. We wanted our mission statement to be front and center. And what the only thing that we found was a little bit of a uh, description about what we do at the Central Vermont Career Center in providing education that allows students to develop professional skills in many different industries. <clears throat> some of them go on to college, some of them are career ready. So one of the, our next steps as a school district is to work on that mission statement. I have things in the way of my screen, so hopefully they're not in the way of yours. <laughs> Um, as part of our ongoing effort to get a more equitable system and to change a little bit about what the Central Vermont Career Center does, we, our budget committee, first look at the resources that we need to just level fund. And as you know, there are things that are changing for all of us. So that, that looked at the resources we need for the instruction, for the supplies that we provide for our students. As you can imagine, there's PPE supplies that we have to get every year not to mention all of the hardware and equipment that we might need. Behind these slides, you'll see some of our current students. And in this case, this is an automotive student. Um, every program gets equipment updates at some point, as much like any of your schools will need updates for different things and you have that capital plan to do that. We as a new district are looking at what are the upgrades that are coming to us, the equipment that we have to update in the next five years. And luckily next year, there are not a lot of big equipment pieces that we need to update. We also developed a, a process for our budgeting that we're gonna use year to year and improve as we go along. And that is available in the slideshow, which can be shared. I can share it in the Zoom link later. Um, also, Floor has it, Megan has it. So it can be shared out with anyone who needs that and they can access that development process. Some important things to note in that is that next Monday, we have a budget forum, which is virtual. I shared that on Front Porch Forum today. So that should be something that your voters can see and attend if they wanna know more about our budget. It's a very similar um, presentation to what we're doing now, except we'll have uh, some more numbers and our business manager and board members will all be present. Some of the conditions that affect our budget for looking ahead to next year are class sizes. Our class sizes are pretty predictable right now because we have a limited amount of space and many of our programs have limited numbers of students they can take. In automotive, for example, or building trades, electrical, we can only have 16 students in there unless we have more staff to support them or more space. Um, currently our med pro classroom only allows us to have 10 students in that. So a lot of the space is the issue around our, our sizes. So we've been, we've been able to grow in the last few years, but we're pretty much at our max with what we have. We are moving to a full day schedule next year. At least that's our plan. And we will include academics. We have taken a couple more classrooms for next year from Spalding High School. Um, so that will help us to keep kids there all day. One of the struggles has been for all of our sending schools is that our kids, they come to us in the morning, they stay until 1230 or one, um, they have, some of them have lunch with us 
And then they go back to their sending school for their academics. And they have some of them a really long bus ride in between. And they're going back to some programming that they may not have been successful with in the past. So we're hoping by holding it here at the center, we can meet the needs a little better by making sure that it's more related to the study that they're doing here in our programs. Um, some of the other things that fall into that, there's a base education rate, which we just got that. It's anticipated at 12,500 this year, coming year. Uh, it was 11,247. As you all know, uh, the health insurance benefits costs are going up by 12.6% next year. We've had increased liability insurances projected at 7 to 9% increase. And the cost of supplies for our building trades program to put together framing and building for any of our programs really to do anything with the actual materials that students would use on a job site, those prices are also going up. So we are in the middle of negotiations or have just started them. I'm sure you're one of our five out of our six inning schools are also negotiating. So I know that um, there are salary increases that we all anticipate. Not sure what those are gonna come out to that health insurance that we talked about. We anticipate adding two full-time teachers um, for the academic supports and also one uh, full-time program instructor as we separate our emergency services and advanced emergency services program. Um, this year, our emergency services teacher was able to teach both programs with just two students piloting the advanced class, which is getting them their paramedic certificate. So next year, we have a lot of interest in moving that forward um, and we're working with BTC to make that happen. Also lots of small line adjustments, um, just to, for accuracy sake, as we took over the budget from Barry and, and really took a look at what our numbers are and where things are going and, and realigned a few things. Our tuition is based on our um, six semester average of full-time equivalents. And so I just have a few of the past numbers here, 144 in FY22, 155 FY23, we're predicting about 160 for FY24. It could be mo more, we're just trying to be conservative in that. Wanted to show you the another look at enrollment just over the years and what our capacity is. A couple of things like automotive, I told you has um, a 16 headcount limit in the program. Those extra two that are were there in um, FY22 were in the co-op program. So additional students that are, they've done the year of automotive and then they've moved out into co-op and they're working in the workforce, like at one of the 802 groups, for example. Um, we also have, if you look at the FTE and the headcount numbers so in a given year, you'll see some differences. This year, for example, you see it in cosmetology um, two and DMA two. Those are adult students. And so they don't fall under the same funding formula as our students that are coming from high schools. Just wanted to show you our rates this year in comparison with most of the other uh, career centers across the state. And then our tuition, um, we anticipate that our tuition will be 19,251, which is an 11% increase. Um, when you take away, my understanding is that the funding for CTE is very complicated. And so there's some, payments made on the state's that's on behalf of our sending schools. So it's maybe taken away from, my understanding is it's taken away from what you would get for that number of FTEs and given to us for the number that six semester average that we have. And there's a few other reductions that are given to us by the state and some grants. And then we have the actual, what we bill your school. So you still have to, I don't know how your business managers do it because I know it's got to be a lot of work, but they have to figure out how many they think are coming and then anticipate both what that reduction is going to be that comes directly to us from the state and then what we're going to bill. One thing that helps is that our billing is on that six semester average. And so we're, we're billing for past students. At least that's how it feels like. And so while we might have 38 students from Washington Central enrolled in our our programs this year, our six semester average might be 34. And my understanding for why that was put in place way back in 2004 is that it helps level um, so that you can predict a little more 
easily how many students you have coming to us each year. And so that you don't pay for 40 one year and 20 the next and, and never know where it's gonna be at, that it's a little more leveled and predictable. This is a look at the Central Vermont Career Center School District's budget by function code that my business manager did. And as you can imagine, in most of these cases, it's the people and that cost the most, the, the instructors for the education, um, and, and other different components of that. We're a very small district, obviously, and so we're learning how to, <clears throat> how to navigate that uh, in our first year. We have a variety of um, revenue sources that were included in that tuition slide, and so we broke them out here. Also, in the total other revenues, there's um, Perkins grant funding that we get, time grants, lots of other grants that we can apply for and add into that. And I just wanna end with thanking you for supporting us and, and your voters for supporting the district and helping us to prepare students for both college and career, supporting the workforce as you do. And I hope that um, this, any questions you have or thoughts you have about this can help us to inform our decisions. We we'll, Again, we're having a community forum next week and um, I'm visiting all the boards. Actually, I was at the Harwood board an hour and a half ago. Um, and so finding out what people are thinking and feeling, then we'll update our budget numbers and our board will approve our budget on uh, January 2nd. for that entire amount. Um, so however that can be disseminated is, is going to be critical, I think, to, for the right information to get shared. And we can all take responsibility for that, but I think utilizing public media is going to be really critical. Yeah, and we have a postcard that's going out. It was printed today, so I expect it's going to be mailed at the end of this week or early next week that has that information going out to the voters across all 18 towns uh, because the town clerks were able to get me that the mailing list for that. So I'm hopeful that will help. It has the same information that's in that front porch forum post today. And so please share that um, widely. And when people ask, refer them there or to our website. And I was just thinking as related to that, I, I mean, I my first December newsletter goes out this Friday. I just made myself a note to add this, in particular, the part that this budget is baked into our budget message is probably the most important thing. So I made that note too. So Jody, is there any reason why that language, um, informative language, cannot be included in the article that's being voted upon? Mm -hmm. Like saying, yeah, this is a $3.5 million budget, mm -hmm. but the respective towns' proportional shares are already included in their budgets. It's not an additional amount, something like that. Because that's going to be the best source for people to understand it when it's, if, if that's what they're looking at in the ballot itself. That's a good point. It, there's a lot, as you know, some of that ballot language is kind of set for us, but that's a good question for me to ask. So I'll reach out to the Secretary of State and see about that doing that, because that's an excellent point. And I guess I'm confused as to why it is separate. So, you know, because what happens if, they, if it, the budget goes down, but we still have it in our budget? I mean, so I guess I'm confused as to why there's a separate vote when the calculation is in our current budget. I'm confused also. <laughs> this has been the way that it always has been. Barry City and Barry Town, I guess, are used to voting for the two. Um, I think there's a change coming with Act 127. There's something around the funding of CTEs and potentially the governance that's going to change. And we're all going to have to look and see what happens with that. I'm not sure why it happens. I know that if our budget goes down, then we need to revisit it. And then also you would get a different bill from us at, as a result of that as we 
would go back out to voters to try to fix that. And I don't know how the board of Central Vermont Career Center would decide to do that. They may decide that if it goes down, it went down because people thought it was extra um, and not embedded in. So it'll be a discussion for sure if we get to that point. We're, we're hoping that by show, we're calling it the Jody Show. It's for December. That's what we schedule. Um, <laughs> we did something, a process similar to what we're doing with our, with our budget. And uh, we're, we're hoping that each of you will help us also. Part of going there is to just clarify that question. And I, and I think it, the other reason that it's voted is separate and why we became a, a separate district was to give us a little bit more ownership, for example, now we're moving into having a full day, right? That was something that we couldn't have done uh, before, and there's just two other career centers in, in within Vermont that are doing a full day, right? Grand Open, Green Mountain, I can't remember right now. There's a few others that have full day, yes. Um, Stafford does as well. And the ballot will be separate again. The ballot will be separate, and we won't be able to do other frustrating from my point of view mm -hmm. is that we can't even though our five towns will approve hopefully approve to send them out and ballot for all our towns we would uh, our process would be to have the 18 towns that send kids to our six sending school district and we already heard from a couple or at least one clerk that you know it's just not gonna happen so so we, we won't be you have to request your town Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Take care. Take care. Feel better. We missed you. Tonight that I will share with the full board um, some conversations that the steering committee has heard a few different times um, around year one goals. And I wanted to kind of start with framing a little bit why this first year of goal setting for me is different than it will look in future years by design. Um, for one thing, these goals are not, you know, eventually superintendent goals and the goals of the system merge. They, that's they are very content driven. They are what we are focusing on. Um, I wouldn't presume to know that answer coming in after six months. So these goals are very process, structure, system focused um, because part of the design is to get us to a place where we have sort of long range system goals. Um, and an example of that is, you know, there's, there's, work that we are focused on that I'll speak to, but the goals are not written specifically around that work. They're written around the systems and structures to achieve the work. Um, so, and that's not gonna look that way forever, but I wanted to share that because some may look at it and say, there's nothing in here about academic achievement and moving kids forward. Um, so I wanted to kind of share that. So what I think I will do, if my slides advance, there we go is frame it around, this is the work of the system. You've seen this before, you've seen it in budget presentations, our faculty has seen this. Um, these are the three areas of focus that all of us are collectively um, working on. And a lot of the more individualized work we have to do to become compliant with new laws, they all fall under these three categories. So this is still there, even if you don't see them in the goals. 
So hopefully I'm going to um, put this a little bit in context of the super, superintendent evaluation process that you all have adopted. So you'll see where we are in that cycle. Share what my approach was to year one goal setting. Um, and that involves thinking about some observations to date, understanding how that connects with the district's priority work, um, the board's priority work, what we hear from the communities, um, and then some some talking points from the steering committee. And then I'll share the goals. And I realized as I say that, I'll just send this around. If you prefer to have something to look at, there's some hard copies of just the goals, not all the slides. I can share the slides after the fact. All right. This is coming around if you, because this is too small to see up here. Um, but you've seen this before or a version of this. This is the superintendent evaluation process that you all adopted. It has <laughs> proposed dates on the right hand side. But I just kind of wanted to ground you with where we are. So the first time the steering committee saw a draft of these was in October, um, gave some feedback, brought a second version in November, and sort of affirmed that yes, these are ready to share with the board, and that's what we're doing tonight. So a little bit about my approach to this, um, given the context of what year one goals are. So coming into the system, and, and I think we've talked about this enough um, so that this is familiar, my focus is on observation and analysis and knowledge building, uh, understanding the system, understanding our team, relationship building, understanding our structures, how do we currently operate, um, and that's really been the focus um, of, of all of those things, and looking at our data, looking at our existing communication structures um, over time. That's where all of this starts. Uh, when I share the slides, there's a link to an entrance planning document that looks much more like a working document than um, than perhaps what some people think of as entrance planning. Out of that, and this is ongoing too, this is not finished. Um, this is not, and in fact, I'm constantly saying, hey, how do we do this? Um, can I look at how, how we structure this in the past? Um, and a lot of conversations, uh, conversations with board members, all of you, conversations with my team and people in the community. And then trying to consolidate themes from all of that work. And uh, interestingly, or maybe not so surprising, actually, there is a lot of consistency uh, themes across all of those groups. Um, and they really started to center around operations and logistics. How do we how do we do our work in this system? That's true of the leadership team. It's true of the board. Um, there was themes around direction setting and the desire for that long term planning and and where are we headed, um, and a lot around communication, communication and engagement. But that is true of all of those audiences, which I think is really interesting. So then my approach was to take all of those themes and integrate them into the other things that this board has identified as important. Integrate them into your board goals, because again, eventually these things will be much more merged. Um, integrate them into our leadership team areas of focus. Um, and integrate them, frankly, connect them to the rubric that you all will use uh, as part of the evaluation. So what you see in front of you looks like a lot of goals. And that is actually because it is aligned to each of the areas in the rubric. One of the pieces of feedback was about the number of goals. So I, I, will, I will acknowledge that. Um, but those are the goal areas, board and superintendent relationship, policy, business and finance, community relations, operational management and leadership, and instructional leadership. Those are the identified areas of the VSBA tool that you all use. Um, I did make adjustments. I'll talk about this in a second. I made adjustments to the grain size based on that feedback. Um, so I did hear it. Uh, and then this is where we are now. So I've presented sort of a few different uh, versions of the goals to the steering committee. We're talking about this tonight and would love to hear feedback. Um, and then eventually the board will hear a reflection, my reflection and evidence of my goals to inform the survey that you will all do as part of the process. So that's sort of the approach. 
I guess I'll keep going and then I'll stop the questions at the end. So I talked about this a little bit. Um, one of the things we talked about is just acknowledging what's the work of the board, what's the work of the superintendent, how are those things connected, um, and how they are connected maybe different moving forward. Uh, we talked about feasibility. Um, that's the green size question. Um, and then this, for me, this I related this last one to a grain size adjustment to one of my versions, but this is working collectively on long-term planning, um, initial versions of the goals, probably process faster than I think it should have. So really the goal was shifted to focus on the first year's work for that. Okay, so now I will kind of walk through, I'll share a little bit about the format, give you the highlights of these, but I, will, I won't read it word for word, and this is what's in front of you. You have a copy of this. So under the board goal area of educational and academic outcomes, three areas that connect to VSBA priorities. Um, across the top, just so you know, these are SMART goals. I think everybody's pretty familiar with what that means. If not, there's a specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely that's across the top. But the three things in this area, we've been spending a lot of time as a leadership team on how do we function together? How do we make decisions together? How do we collaborate? Um, so that's a big area of focus. I'm very grateful for the leadership team that you all have, so thank you. <laughs> um, one of the areas under here is administrator evaluation process. So um, again, in the spirit of coming into the structures that currently exist, my focus this year is on getting to know all of the administrators. What are their goals? What are, what are they doing within their system or they're part of the organization? Um, there are existing tools and rubrics for us to use. Um, eventually, I would love to work with administrators on what, what is a meaningful evaluation process? What are some feedback cycles? How do we get input from um, all the people that we work with? But I don't wanna hand that to the team. I think the team should be part of developing that. So this year, it'll be focused on on understanding and learning them and their systems. Uh, yes, there will be a written component, there always is. But eventually I'd like to work with the team on, on what that process could look like moving forward. And the last piece under educational and academic outcomes is the ed quality work. And this goal is refined a little bit. This goal was originally just about monitoring and data collection. That really is the really good work that's happening with ed quality. So that's this piece. And keep going. Communication. So this is a this is a big goal. It is a big goal of the board. And the year one portion of this for me is to develop initial ways that I, as a superintendent, will communicate with our um, students, faculty, and the community. Um, and you all receive what I send, so I think you have a sense of how it's evolving, and it'll continue to evolve based on the feedback that we get. Um, you know, in the what is engagement versus communication, this is still in the communication level for sure. I mean, we're, I think we're doing a better job at hearing from people. This will evolve. And then under your board area of long-term planning, the three things um, for me is uh, what are our board structures? So just getting to know how you all operate um, and and how you work toward your own goals. So that's a lot about our work plan. It's a it's our board training, our work with Phil. It's shifting how we give information to you through the superintendent reports. Um, eventually, you'll be able to give feedback about um, pieces related to that. Um, we've talked a lot about policy. Um, we are working toward having a policy review cycle and having a more predictable way that we will review things on a regular basis, but also review things because we have to or because we want to or because our community tells us we should. Um, so that's a goal 
And then that this final one is where is the board in its visioning and strategic planning process? I mean, we've started those conversations um, soon. I, I, we had a great subgroup conversation around our what's the question that we're asking for help to answer around strategic planning. Um, so that the year one work is really getting that off the ground and helping to structure what that process will look like. So there's a lot more information there than I just spoke to. So I'll stop talking now. Questions, comments, thoughts? I, I see goals as iterative, they're never stamped. So it's not, I, I'd be happy to have feedback. I appreciate your process. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the, the clarity around that process is very um, um, helpful and just uh, is reassuring to me as, as to you as our leader through different systems. <clears throat> Do you think you're moving forward in terms of getting to know the um, your, your team members and the staff and the feel for the vision? I think so. I, I would say particularly the leadership team, they can probably answer this. And they will have a chance to answer that. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I for me, the circles are, I do, as an instructional leader, my, my closest group of where I want to go and learn is the, our leadership team. It's also been really nice to spend time in the buildings, get to know faculty. Um, haven't I, I want to continue to do this, so I'm excited about that, but sitting down with students, um, our student council has a finance committee. They are, I know Suzanne's a little afraid of this, but they are excited to learn about the budget process. Um, so it's been great. I mean, I knew this because this is why I wanted to be here, but we have great schools great people, um, so it's been really nice. And I still have plenty of work to do to get to know people. Have you heard of any obstacles that you didn't expect? The obstacles not in a negative way, they're just like, oh my goodness, I'm spending so much time doing this and taking away from Oh, that's a bad that. question. Uh, I think the, the obstacles are the parts of the work that are always gonna be hard. Mm -hmm. Budget building is hard, figuring out how to dedicate our resources is hard. Um, Equity work is hard, right? Um, so I don't, I don't know that those are obstacles so much as there's a lot of work in education. So. Thank you. Yeah. Does, is this the timeline for the superintendent evaluation process? Does it feel so appropriate or too accelerated? I guess particularly in light of like year one role. So. Well, I think for me, and this might have more to do with how I understand supervision to be successful, because this is a process that gives me feedback so that I can change and adjust what I'm doing. The fact that it's going to land in a piece of paper in end of February, early March instead of June doesn't make that much difference to me because it's always going to be point in time. So when I reflect to you in January or February, sure, if I reflected in January, would I be giving you more information? Yes. And But because I see the process as iterative, I'm uncomfortable with that. And I know the rationale for having this timeline is so that you all who've spent the most time with me are the ones who get to give the feedback as opposed to folks who, and there won't be a lot, but there will be a couple of new cases. Speaking of spending time with you, I'm so new. I I I was under the impression that you had been here for so long. Well, okay. So when did I, I'm sorry, if we could just if I No, could that's no okay. Yeah. And actually you're um reminding me as an aside. I have had the opportunity to sit down individually with all the board members. It's part of what I did this summer, and I haven't had the opportunity to do with you. Oh. So we should set up a time. Sure. But July 1st is when I oh. started. Very okay. nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think the steering committee has had the opportunity to look at this. 
uh, more in, in depth. And I, I really appreciate how you align the priorities, the academic in the safety schools. And uh, I feel like you have integrated well on all of the four uh, priorities. And also, I just want to uh, hear in Daniel's question is that I think as a, as, as a board, our idea of supervision, especially for this uh, or evaluation for the first year, is that growth both for you and for us to 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 learn more about about each other and align our future goals together. Right. So the timeline, well, you know, like. Uh, the context of that should be this is your first year mm -hmm. and we're all getting to know each other. We're all learning to communicate and collaborate. And I'm very excited. And I have to laugh a little bit and give credit to my leadership team who reminded me to put in the slide around our work areas because the goals <laughs> were so system focused. And I said, you may want to remind the board that this all is in service to so body work. So <laughs> thank you for highlighting that. So the slide was a last minute ad. It felt good. <laughs> <laughs> the organization aligns with our committee work mm -hmm. and board work as well as your work. And that makes it easy for me to see how it's lined up as well. Right. Uh, I like that organization. It feels like maybe, I don't know if it's at the beginning of the summer or the end of the summer, maybe we add to this an opportunity to just check on the alignment of our goals and then Yes. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I think it's a good question. I do think that what it will, sh some of these, I mean, that work's not going to be finished overnight, so they won't totally go away, but they will start to merge with the the, the structure of the goals will be based around the work that the strategic planning process has revealed that it's that it's now my job to carry forward. Um, but yes, I think there will be an inherently more to the process in the future years, just based on time. I suspect. It'll inform our summer retreats. Yes, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. I would also hope that the, the, over the long term, we'll, the superintendent performance evaluation will be more than just one point in the year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there would be at least one check mid-year where we can just make sure we get on the same page. Because I think everybody benefits from smaller amounts of feedback, mm -hmm. but right now. session at the end of the meeting okay. for negotiations. So but we just have two two reports here. So I'll move that board to qualify third tech company LLC engineers construction in Dragon Construction Company in GW Tatro Construction uh, in J Hutchins in JA McDonald in Kingsbury Companies and SD Ireland Brothers Corporation is bidders for the U thirty two parking lot and sidewalk uh, we try. Thank you. I'll second it. Thank you, Wendy. Any discussion, any no. questions? There was a memo in the packet. No. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. And one more. Page 16, to approve the new teachers, Cindy? Sure. Um, I make a motion um, to appoint Alex Donaldson as a long-term substitute for U32 math um, teacher. A second? Second. Thank you, Dana. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, all of those in favor to signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you, everybody. So that concludes our business for tonight. <laughs> but we need to, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's brief because it all has changed since last time. So um, the positions that the good news is we are we are almost fully staffed with the exception of SLPs, um, but we are still persistently uh, understaffed with maintenance, custodial, and lunch, food service at the high school. Care, care and care. Mm -hmm. And specialization. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. So the update is, is the same. Does this start in January? This one uh, just... started Monday. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad we approved it. <laughs> um, I appreciate the approval. <laughs> we really need it. For those of you that don't know and you might already know this, but Stephen is also teaching calculus this year. No, we we got it. Okay. Oh, sorry. Bring it down a level. It's all the same for me. <laughs> you would not want me teaching that. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to have, I was just chatting with Ursula. <laughs> so, thank you everybody for being here. This is a good for that quick meeting. And we feel very welcome to ask these things and staff and everybody is involved in making this feel. Yes. It was worth the drive of the fall. Uh, the bowl, uh, on the back. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's the next step. That's the next step. I'm going to need a motion to go into executive session and for, okay, to help with tech. You know, we spoke with Ursula and she's okay. You guys feel better. Okay? Thank you for being here. So we are going to adjourn the meeting. Okay. I have a motion. Sorry. Are we adjourning or going to executive session? We're going to go into executive session, but we're going to adjourn the public so meeting. Okay. Right? Who yeah. did we adjourn the public section of our meeting tonight? Thank you, Chris. Okay, okay so Chris and Lindy. <laughs> have to adjourn. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be like building staff. It would be yeah. 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 So I just need a motion to go into executive session and we're going to move into the library and include Megan to come in into the executive session with us. Okay, so I don't have Jonas's fancy words, but I move that we go into executive session uh, for the top for the purpose of negotiations and to include Megan. Um, do we need Suzanne? I don't think so. No. Suzanne say no. You don't no, need I, 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 I have a second. 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 Oh. Daniel was right next to me, sorry. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye and walk to the library. The ayes have it.